Hey, everybody, and welcome to ABA Inside Track, the podcast that's like reading in your car, but safer. I'm your host, Robert Perry Cruz, and with me, as always, are my fabulous co-hosts. Hey, Rob, it's me, Diana. And it's me, Jackie, eating a fun dip piece of candy. Delicious. Well, everybody, you are listening to ABA Inside Track, a podcast where we talk about behavior analytic research. This is episode 30, where we will be talking about prompting. If you're new to the show, you just think I have really sexy uh, bass voice. But if you are a current listener, I don't sound like Kermit the Frog because I'm a little under the weather today. So apologies for sounding kind of stupid. I think you sound like an operator from being (laughs) green in your last episode. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I went green. I used all biodegradable items, and now I'm sick. No, now you're like Kermit. Uh, I don't, sa- but I don't sound like Kermit. Oh, normally you sound like Kermit. Normal, more normally I sound like Kermit. I've got like a hi ho. It's Rob here. That's not. That's not me. What? Where did I come from? That's not today. Today I just sound like Stuffy the I'm Bear. Sorry, I'm sorry. You're sick. You sh- you should be. I blame you. I'm not. You're not sorry. I'm sick. <laughs> nope. <laughs> I want everyone to be sick. Get it all out because then it'll be spring. Everyone will be like, "Yeah, I got all my winter sickness out," mm. and then we won't be sick again. I don't get sick very often, and I'm really bad at being sick. So I can see that. Yeah, yeah. D- Diana told me I ran out of my bad of being sick uh, today. Everyone was tired of it. She said, Aww. "It's like day three. <laughs> this. <laughs> well, in any case, today we're going to be talking about research related to prompting. You all use prompting, don't you? I do. Yeah." Sometimes. You kind of have to. You kind of have to. Well, if you need to learn new things, you have to have a way to teach people those new things. And generally that's done through a combination of prompting and reinforcement. That's true. That is really true. Even in typically a developing population, if you're going to teach a kid skills, you may use some modeling. But if that's not sufficient, then you would help them through it, you know, by giving them gestures or verbal prompts. Yeah. Well, I mean, any type of instruction. Right. It could be viewed as a prompt. That's true. Mm-hmm. Cha ching. Well. Your- if you're just going to wait around for a response induction, <laughs> that's awesome. And you're probably going to be waiting a long time. Forever. Yeah. yeah. What are what are your all favorite prompts? My favorite prompt overall, I really love um the verbal prompt because I like how I like the most least verbal prompt because I like that sometimes you're like balloon balloon. <laughs> Bal- <laughs> I like that. And that then last one was just the um, inquisitive look yeah. that Jackie did. That's you, could, you couldn't see it. <laughs> That's my <laughs> most, most favorite one. Like, you know you want to say something. That's my most favorite. Like, ooh, expectant eye gaze. That's what it is. Expectant uh, look. Yeah. yeah. That's my most, most favorite. But I do like it when it's like, blah, blah, blah. Like, and so if you did that to, like, anyone, like an adult, they'd be like, what, what are you doing? Right. Sometimes I use the partial verbal on my kids and they look at me like what yeah. was that it's a bit condescending <laughs> you just, like yeah. when you say stroke that? in the middle of your say word blue. yeah <laughs> <laughs> how about you Diana? i think that my favorite is one that i don't really prescribe that much and I, it's my favorite because i think we should use it more which is the model prompt mm-hmm. sometimes you just need to show kids what to do and then they can do it mm-hmm. and it's much easier be- than trying to manually guide through a task yes because often if you're manually guiding through a task and i'm sure we'll talk about this more there's no response needed on the part of the child and they may not be paying attention at all Mm. to what they're being guided through there are a lot of those on youtube of of the adult prompting the child through something while the kid's sort of Looking staring away. off into space and yeah they're just like look i'm manually guiding you to do exactly. a puzzle and they're like if i just tolerate this manual guidance it'll be over <laughs> soon and i'll get my reinforcer what skill did you learn today <laughs> just wait how to tolerate <laughs> manual guidance it's <laughs> awesome yeah so i really like the model prompt for that reason you have to look you have to observe and then you have to do mm. that's a good one excellent what well, about you oh <laughs> thank you for asking <laughs> i didn't think you were going to i like a good graduated guidance myself oh it's hard to teach i was gonna say it's hard to implement how so people just get, get that wrong a lot. oh 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 no yes oh okay i understand i thought you meant in terms of its, its utility and i was gonna feel really stupid <laughs> no <laughs> use it on everyone <laughs> no i think people shy away from it because it's so difficult to 
get right on the part of the teacher? Oh, I spent like a good month practicing graduated guidance and setting up graduated guidance training and drilling graduated guidance into staff members so that they would use it correctly. Did you staple it right to them? I used tag teaching, but I used an air horn instead of a, a, a tag clicker. <laughs> Did that work? And I used a verbal word. Wrong! It's wrong! Me. You're wrong! Everyone yeah. loves you at your job. <laughs> I love to use graduate again, you know, to teach the children. With adults, I'd love any sort of, you know, screaming method is always good. <laughs> that's great. And that's why I'm sick now. So, so cool. that's, that's my fave. That's okay. my fave. And today we're going to be talking about two studies which do what I think we all love, which is, hey, let's take a bunch of ideas that everybody uses and let's pit them up against each other and only one only one will win. So when I when I when you say this, I always think of that toy that's like a ring. It's like a wrestling ring, but there's like a blue wrestling oh, guy. Oh, Rock'em Sock'em Sock'em robots. robots. Yeah, blue guy, red guy, and mm. then you're just like pow, 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 pow. And one of their heads will pop off. Yep. This is what's happening in these two studies. This is, it's like I a think research. Of, um, two men enter. It's a research Thunderdome. Yeah, Thunderdome. Yes. <laughs> wow. <laughs> two prompting methods enter. One prompting method leaves. <laughs> we don't need another prompting method. <laughs> Whoa. And who said prompting wasn't fun? <laughs> wow. Not us. Not us. <laughs> I'm cured. Thank you, Tina Turner. <laughs> So we'll be talking about two articles, a comparison of most to least and least to most prompting on the acquisition of solitary play skills by Libby Weiss, Bancroft, and Ahern from Behavior Analysis and Practice in 2008. And our second article, comparison of simultaneous prompting and no, no prompting in two choice discrimination learning with children with autism by Leif, Sheldon, and Sherman from the Journal of Applied Behavior Analysis 2010. Is this the same Sherman that did the, you have the right to take a nap and eat too many donuts? I gotta look that up. I don't know. Okay. I don't think it's the same guy. I don't think it is either. I also don't think this is the same Leif as Leif and McKechnie, 1993. Or Leif Erickson. Not spelled differently. He's a Viking. <laughs> hmm. He well, did anyway. no research. Cool. Anywho. Uh, Anywho. Do you think this is the same Sheldon from uh, Happy Acres on the Garfield show? Yeah. Okay. Well, at least we know that. Yeah. I definitely do. Okay. Yeah. I thought you were going to say Sheldon from the Big Bang Theory. Me too, actually. To make a, to make a reference that, you no. know, it's from this century. <laughs> no. I would say his catchphrase, but I've never seen that show. Me neither. Does he have a catchphrase? Did I'm I do seen- that? <laughs> that's, yeah, that's it. That's, that's it. You got that's, it. That's actually Family Matters, Steve Urkel. Oh, darn it. Anyway. TJF the 90s, Diana. Yeah, that came on right after Step by Step. It sure did. Ooh, baby. No, I think um, you're wrong, Diana. Step by Step was a nine. Family Matters came after Full House. Oh, it's true, actually. Where did Boy Meets World come in there? Uh, Every day on the I, Disney saw, it, it was when they had a different rotation of yeah. TJF. I stopped watching at that point. I didn't. I love Boy Meets World. I did, too. When, it, when I'm sick, this is the last thing, and then we'll really go into the article. When I was sick now... It's usually on ABC Family or now what it's called, Freeform, Freeform. or whatever. Oh, yeah. And it's on at 9 to 9.30. And if ever I'm sick or I'm like not left work for work yet, I'm like, well, I can't leave now. Boy Meets World is I know what on. happens to Ryder. <laughs> In Topanga. What was it? Oh, yeah. Topanga. That's oh, what you're yeah. I actually watch Girl we- Meets World now on the Disney Channel. Is it the, it's a sequel? Is that of the same caliber? It, no. It's not on the same caliber, <laughs> but it is a sequel. Topanga and Boy. I can't remember his Corey? name. Corey. Corey. They got married, have a kid, and the it's the kid. It's a girl. Wow. <gasps> yeah. Wow. Spoiler <laughs> on the Disney Channel. Is Mr. Feeny still there? Yes. Oh, my God. That guy must be so old. He's so old. Yeah. Do you know, uh, piece of trivia, Mr. Feeny played the voice of Kit the Car from Knight Rider. Oh, I did not That's really special. Knight Rider. Thank you for sharing. With David Hasselhoff playing at your movie theater Friday. Who's going first today? Me, me, me. All right, Jackie, you go. Me. I'm going to talk about the Libby article on prompting with the acquisition of solitary play skills. Can I ask you a quick question? Sure. It's a bit inside baseball. Was this related to research similar to that that was done? I I don't know if it's the exact same group, but they looked at prompting methods for task analyses? Yes. Okay. Same group. Same Same research group. It's called the TA research group. Okay. Yeah. Real creative name. Yep. They really uh, hit the ball out of the park with that name. Oh, no, I just remember the t- when they because um, Julie did a presentation on the on the TAs for a group yes. I was in a while back, and I remember I still tell people that. And they go, "Where'd you learn about this?" And I'm like, "Julie Weiss, of course." 
and they shut up. They don't even know if that's a real person. They just <laughs> if you say a name when someone asks you about research, you're probably no more than they Brenda. do. Brenda, Brenda yeah. taught one, it to me. This article has the picture of the famed Lego constructs. Yeah. in there, so Which you know it's nice. part of the same yeah. research okay. group. Um, yeah. So what they were looking at here is how we can efficiently and effectively teach behavior chains. Um, one thing I love about this article is that they give definitions for everything. They're like, a behavior chain is a sequence of responses leading to a terminal behavior. Objective. So that's like pretty helpful, right? Because sometimes yeah. you use the word, but we don't really talk about it. Yeah. And then they're like, effective. This is what effective means. <laughs> it <laughs> did. If the skills are learned. Efficient. If they learned it quickly with minimal errors. I like that. So the introduction was very thorough. And gave yeah. a, some good definitions of commonly used words that we don't necessarily always define. Yeah, I think that's kind of nice. I, I loved think it, it was, you know, related to being published in BAP. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So the audience, the audience is more for clinicians that may need a refresher, or not. I don't know if the, that population really does. No, they probably don't. But, but I yeah. like the refresher always. Mm. I need a refresher. Yeah, that's yeah. kind of nice. They wanted to teach play skills, so they chose Lego constructs because you can make them of equal difficulty and you can make arbitrary sets so that you know that the students have never built these before. And, you know... Yeah, they're almost like a metaphor for a play skill. Right. Right? They kind of are, right? (laughs) But I mean... The proto-play skill. If you're going to pick a play skill that's ubiquitous... God, I love using that word. Mm. Building things with Legos. I mean, all kids except for me built things with Legos yeah. at some point. And it scales up with age, right? To still be relatively age appropriate, right. even for older kids, which I I do like that a lot. Yeah. yeah. And they do have a big assortment of Lego subsets, you know. So if you're a kid and you like Star Wars, or you like superheroes, or you like just building or Minecraft, I mean, they're all the kids. All right. the kids love Minecraft That's these true. days. That they have Lego Minecraft. You've now. got yeah, you got you've yeah. got those sets. So even mm-hmm. if you're not big on Legos, you might be big on one of those brands and then maybe i'll try out this lego because i can make a spaceship or i can make a minecraft house right i think one common limitation that we've talked about though when looking at this type of research is that the legos even though it's you know functionally appropriate it still is fairly arbitrary right so it's Mm. like some weird structure if you look they don't really look like anything yeah they're just kind of creepy creepy blocks on top of one another you can make it look like a house kind of like a shoe right but most of them don't really look like anything. No. That's something that when I've talked about this article in the past, that's one of the criticisms that people bring up is that if I saw a kid building those constructs, those arbitrary contracts, they're like, what are you building? Right? Right. So. But this is a research article. In it which is you a have research to article. For yep, it's true. Things like, what is the difficulty of these a- Legos? Absolutely. Set? Yeah. But I think when you're looking at it in terms of the seven dimensions, we're supposed to make it, is it a problem? And can we make it sure that it's going to be socially significant for the individual? I mean, yeah, building Legos is, but building arbitrary construction things may not be. Yeah. So that's just, that's just yeah, the next step. Yeah, next step is Take it and up. find, like, equal Minecraft and right. Star Wars Lego sets. Right. And then see if it still applies. Yeah. But regardless. I have to say, though, we were, yeah. we were at Target and... My son saw a Minecraft Lego set, and it says on there, like, build in multiple ways. And he was like, oh, this set you can make into anything you want. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> like, oh, all Legos you can really make that's into awesome. anything That's because I've want. been telling him not to take them out of the bags we've organized them in by their genre of Lego. Mm, and I think he's... I think I found the problem. Yeah, it's <laughs> actually kind of awesome. <laughs> But I think, you know, the foundation or the crux of the article, looking at the different prompting procedures, is very valid, very socially valid. And yeah. Something that we need to know about. Mm-hmm. So what they wanted to look at is the physical prompts that we use typically to teach behavior change. So, you know, there's two big ones, right? The most to least prompting and the least to most prompting. And then sometimes, you know, you get a little crazy and throw in a time delay in there. Mm-hmm. Um, but most to least, usually you start more intrusive, doing some hand over hand gradually move up the arm sometimes you add in that late touch and shadow which i love watching you know it's like taboo yeah i'm not touching you i'm not touching you but i kind of am yeah i say that to my sister to annoy her um but then the least and most one nice thing about that is that you're giving the child the opportunity you know to do the skill i just i want to in the interest of full disclosure i just want to let you guys know i hate 
least to most prompting. You do. I love I it. I hate it. I think it's sloppy and it is sloppy. But that's, that's why you like graduated guidance. Yeah, well, graduated guidance, I feel like, takes some of the positives of, mm-hmm. of most to least and least to most mm-hmm. in there. So, well, I mean, you know, spoiler alert, they do a little bit looking at how to sort of make each prompt take the best components of the other type of prompt. But I, I just wanted to let everyone know, I, I went into this with a real bias. I was hoping least to most would lose and lose hard. Oh, yeah? Yeah. This total WWE smackdown. That was, yeah. I, I wanted them to be sent to the wasteland, never to return, but... We'll see if that happens, I guess. <laughs> okay. So they wanted to just look to see which one would be faster, which one would be more efficient and effective. Right. Yeah. So the study had five participants. And one interesting thing, which I may posit could be a limitation, is that they used forward chaining for all the participants. Mm. Because we have read previous research suggesting that some children learn better with backward chaining or total task versus forward chain. So this could be a limitation because we don't have the history of these students. Mm. So Good that's point. when I was reading. I was like, ooh. Yeah. But everyone's doing it the same for right. for prompting sync. But it yes. would have made the, st- the study stronger if they had said, you know, and an assessment was done to unequivocally state that all these children learned better with forward chains. Yeah. And they did teacher complete. Yeah. As well, which is also kind of unusual. Yeah. That is pretty uh, – that is unusual. So what they did is they had four different constructs for the each student. They did a multi-element design. Each construct was built with one of the prompts. Yeah, so they all had like a base plate. Yep. Right? Oh, yeah, it's base like plate. size of like half a sheet of paper, and they're Duplos. I never played Legos, so my you mom. missed out, man. No, I really did. So they had like a base plate. It was about the size of half a sheet of paper, right? Yeah. And then the construct was built on top of it, maybe like 10 different There was a, It blocks? was an eight-step chain. Eight steps, okay. Yeah. And you can actually go and view the task analysis on the ABAI website. If you go to abiinternational.org backslash BA in practice cool. dot ASP, um, you can see the task analysis okay. and follow along. Ooh. Yeah, you too can build an arbitrary <laughs> design. Yeah, so they used um, a least to most. They had independent, light touch shadow, manual guidance at upper arm, manual guidance at forearm, and then hand over hand, and the most to least, hand over hand, manual guidance at forearm, manual guidance at upper arm, light touch and shadow and an independent. They started each session by saying, let's play, and then they just built the Legos with whatever prompting design that they used. And they had the same sort of error correction procedure for each of them and when to move up or down steps that was all fairly similar Mm -hmm. mastery criteria was the same for each of them and any errors were fixed with uh, hand over hand guidance and so what they wanted to look is to see how many sessions it took to acquire the skills in most to least and least to most and how many errors per session and what was pretty cool, I think, is that it took the kids less time to complete the Legos using least and most, but they made more errors. Right. Mm-hmm. Which is pretty pretty interesting. Well, they had the opportunity to make more errors. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. So if you have a student that does not like making errors, that might be problematic. I had a student that any time you said no or try again, he would flip the table and punch you in the face. Mm-hmm. So oh, we should talk about him with my article then. <laughs> yeah. So we we would never really give him the opportunity. We we use most yeah, of these sure. until the end. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> He'd be like, try again. And then flip the table. <laughs> yeah, oh, man. So that was pretty interesting that they found that those results. And for two of the five participants, they switched over for to most to least to actually acquire the skills. So they weren't acquiring the skills on least to most. And then they switched over to most of least, and then the skills were acquired. All right. Yeah. There you go, then. Yeah. So then they also showed that two of the five participants showed that most of least was more effective and efficient. So both yes. faster and better. Faster and better. New and improved. <laughs> yeah, right? But then I think it was pretty cool that they then did study two, where they added a most of least with a delay. Right. So maybe it was that most of least was taking longer because you didn't give the student the opportunity, but if you add this delay in, then the student then gets the opportunity, but they also get the prompt if they need it. Yeah, because they made the point that 
with most to least, there were eight sessions minimally right. before the student even had an opportunity to right. respond independently. Yeah. And so what they did find is that all of the participants acquired the Legos during least to most faster again. Mm-hmm. Um, but most to least was just as effective with least to most with fewer errors. Yeah. And okay. one other thing I like is that they did generalization probes following the training and the skills were acquired as well. So that was nice. They didn't just train and then they're like, we're done and throw the papers in the air. We're out. And one thing I love about this study and how they wrote it is that I think it's it's well laid out, but then at the end they give you these little like clinical bullets. Like, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I like that so much. Like, here's some recommendation. Most at least with the time today is, li- is likely the best default response. It's preferable if errors have been found to impede a child's learning or increase problem behavior. But at least the most can be used if students show rapid acquisition. So they kind of gave us like like golden nuggets at the end um, that we could kind of glean from if we need to use this yeah. for clinical purposes. I know Dorothea Lerman did a, a, a nice talk and has published a couple sort of practice best practice guidelines, you know, so mm-hmm. how, how do you take this research? Because, again, we have lots of folks, and especially people who are listening to this show, where they're, they're reading the research, they're trying to keep up, but it doesn't always lend itself to, oh, now that I've read this research, I know exactly what to do at all times. And sometimes it's nice to just be able to say, no, 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 here's 30 articles that specifically talked about this. Here's what you should do to start. You probably, ha- you know, you have to be smart about it. You can't just, nope, everybody gets this prompt, and I'll never change it, but given no information, sort of like they, they posit in the article, do this. And then if you find this other problem, this might be the next one you want to try. So right. start with your most to least uh, with a two-second delay. And especially if the kids you're working with hate making errors. And then you can go from there. You can right. decide what works best for that that student. Yeah. And I like ha- – I mean, I like having that. As someone who does more practice than I do research – it's so nice. As much as I like to feel smart, because I read the research myself, and I, it's sometimes it's nice just to be like, "Here's the piece of paper right. that tells you what to do, <laughs> and know. you'll be a good person." I like I like that too, and I <laughs> and I do research as well, so I read the research, but I still like that. Oh, I right. actually got what I was supposed to get out of that <clears> article. <throat> well, it's like, would you rather go foraging through the forest for berries that are scattered among a whole bunch of different shrubs, or would you like to just pick up the basket of pre? foraged berries that's just waiting on the edge of the forest that's going to depend on how adventurous you are that's true sometimes the journey is really what matters (laughs) yeah no in this case the journey is not what matters (laughs) it's a crap forest you don't want to go in there it's all those wonderful results just waiting for you in that basket that someone that's what the meta-analysis is right Mm. they've already calm down (laughs) i'm so excited (laughs) knocking things over They've already foraged the berries for you, and they're just waiting there, one, sorted and classified. Yeah. One thing they do note, though, is that although I find, I think that these results do have generality, the participants were all in one residential facility yeah. at one school. It wasn't really a lot of <laughs> spreading out. They were all the same yeah. age. Do they talk about their history with regard to prompting strategies? Because that would be interesting to know, too. Like, have they had most to least their whole life? Mm-hmm. No, they just say that they're, they're participants, they have a diagnosis of autism, they're between the ages of 9 and 15, they all live in the same residential facility, but this may not work. They love to build Legos. Right. And they love to build Legos. Maybe. Maybe now they hate Legos. <laughs> <laughs> to building all these arbitrary designs. Right. But but this is this is a good starting point, I think, for someone that's like, oh no, where do I start? So, Right. Maybe a new budding behavior analyst. Don't just do something you've done before just because you did it before, but maybe look through the research and say, okay, this is what this article is suggesting. Mm-hmm. Maybe when, you're I can getting st- a, when you're getting a new student on your caseload yeah, that you don't know anything about their learning history or how they've been taught in the past. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. This is a good way to go. It's most to least with a two-second prompt delay. And then as you get to know them, you can always make changes. Which you should because we are, we are a field of individualization. Exactly. Neat. All right, everybody. Everybody. No, thanks, Jackie. We didn't do anything. We did all the talking. Thanks, Jackie. Thanks, Jackie. Thanks, Ja. <laughs> thanks, J. J. Thanks, expectant luck. All right. We're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back with our second article. With your friends behind the bleach. 
Precious tonight, there's a dance. He's gonna be there in the high school gym. And it's almost hey, ABA Inside Trackers. Are you interested in being a behavior analyst and you're not yet? If so, I really would recommend looking into the Regis College Master's in Science and Applied Behavior Analysis program. Our 2016 pass rates for first-time test takers of the BCBA exam was 90%. We think this is a true testament to our program. In addition, we're going to be starting an on-campus autism center in the summer of 2017. This is going to allow our graduate students on hands learning right at our college and you will receive partial tuition remission if you work at the center, which is pretty amazing. We also offer paid clinical placements and graduate assistantships starting in our students' first year, where all of our grad students are working in the field either part-time or full-time. I find you that job. <laughs> that is part of my job. We also are approved by the BACB to provide intensive practicum, so students will complete 750 hours of an intensive practicum across their time at Regis. All of our faculty are PhD-level BCBAs with strong applied and research backgrounds in ABA and all have published papers in respected peer-reviewed journals. We ensure small class sizes so that all students receive personalized attention from their professors and advisors are easily accessible to meet with students. Two more really great things that I want to highlight about the Regis program is that we host an invited lecture series at Regis each year, which involves inviting outside experts in ABA to speak on specialized topics relating to practicing ABA. Last summer, we completed an international service trip to Iceland. This trip enables students to learn more about providing culturally competent care to diverse populations. Students and alums work with children diagnosed with an autism spectrum disorder and provided parent and teacher trainings for 11 days. This service trip occurs every other year, and the next trip will be in the summer of 2018. And finally, we have a great location. We're just 12 miles from the center of Boston. We currently have rolling admission. We're accepting students until we reach capacity for the fall of 2017. Please check us out at www.regiscollege.edu. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, and we are back here at ABA Inside Trek with our next exciting article. Diana, you're going to take us into the wild and woolly world of the no-no prompt. No, no. No, no. No, no prompt means no, no. <laughs> so, spoiler alert, these results surprised me. Yeah. They totally surprised me. How is that a spoiler? We don't, know, we don't know what your thought process was on That's this. That's true. But my last one wasn't that surprised. Right. Mm. But this one, I was like, what? I did not expect this at me all. Me neither. But I'm glad I read it because then I love having a little, a little suspense and surprise in my life. Studies like this always do make me feel like I'm a good behavior analyst because I'm looking at the results and not making a statement and saying, I refuse to accept them because I have a preconceived notion about prompting hierarchies. Yeah, I know. It, like, Which totally, I do, I was but like, I didn't oh, want to. Oh, man, I guess I should be thinking about this more. So I'm excited to bring this article to our audience so they can also think about this. Yes. But, Diana, before we get into that second article, I did want to let our listeners know, if you're new to the show or if you've listened before, ABA Inside Track is actually a continuing education provider source. So all you need to do is listen to the episode with rapt attention and pick out our two secret code words. And then you can click a link and send them to us so we know that you listen to the whole darn thing. All right. So our first keyword is interceptor. Diana, please spell that for me because you wrote it down. Can you use it in a sentence, please? This is the last of the V8 interceptors in Thunderdome. Interceptor. I-N-T-E-R-C-E-P-T-O-R. Interceptor. Interceptor. Now playing. All right. And then actually, actually, before we go, Jackie, you had done some research while we were taking our break and you noted we, yeah. made, a, we made a mistake. So you can't send it in and tell us we were wrong. I've errated myself. <laughs> it is when we were talking about this study that Diane is going to talk about, we saw that there was a Sheldon and a Sherman as authors, and I wondered if they were the same people that wrote the Balancing the Right to Habilitation with the Right to Personal Liberties, the rights of people with developmental disabilities to eat too many donuts and take a nap. And it is the same people. <gasps> so I find that crazy because I thought one of them was a lawyer, but I guess maybe not. Who knows? But maybe nice. one of them is a lawyer. 
Perhaps. But yeah, so those are the same people. Thanks for doing that background work. Welcome. You know, it was hard work. I had to put my hair in a small ash ponytail. I love it. It's real <laughs> cute. Yeah. First time. <laughs> First time glad. for everything. I was worried we were going to like a little dumb. pebbles ponytail. <laughs> it is. All right, you ready? I'm ready. Okay, that's enough of this. You, you go on, girl. All right, so Leaf, Sheldon, and Sherman compared two types of prompting for skill acquisition. Simultaneous prompting and no-no prompting. I didn't know either of these terms, really, before mm-hmm. this article. No, I, no, I didn't either. No, no. No, no. I, did, I knew simultaneous prompting, and I've heard of no-no prompting. I initially, I thought it was like go no go that's different that's a different thing that's yeah. like a space thing <laughs> no, no no that's just because we just saw hidden figures it's not oh, okay. it's not just a space <laughs> thing <laughs> but it wasn't that's a different that thing entirely and we'll have to talk about it another time but this simultaneous prompting just means providing a prompt immediately following the sd mm. that's going to control responding by indicating the correct response and it could take many different forms, vocal, gestural, model, etc. But it's going to happen right away. So it's not a delayed prompt. It's just an immediate prompt. I feel like it falls into the territory of errorless teaching, but it's mm-hmm. an immediate prompt. So that's simultaneous prompting. And they were comparing that to the no-no prompt. No-no. No, 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 no,
So they determined what those were going to be. They then did a controlling prompt assessment where they provided four different types of prompts, including a positional prompt. So like one of the, the correct stimulus would be closer, perhaps, or highlighted in some way. A model prompt in which they modeled the correct response. A gestural prompt in which they pointed to the correct response. A full physical prompt in which they manually guided the correct response. And they looked to see under which controlling prompt responding occurred. With 100% accuracy. With 100% accuracy. With Japanese letters. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Kanji. Yeah. So there's no chance that these guys knew that. So yeah. for Jeremy, that. the gestural prompt worked better. And then for Brady and Ashley, the full physical prompt worked better. So that's what they used. And then after all of that was out of the way, they finally got to move into the actual treatment. But of course, before they did that, they needed to do some probe. So throughout this study, there were opportunities for full probe which was probing all six sets of stimuli that were either in training or going to be trained, as well as daily probe in which they just probed the stimuli that were going to be trained for that day. There was no prompting or reinforcement provided during the probe sessions. So once those were done, they ran their comparison between the no-no prompting and the simultaneous prompting. Each of two sets of stimuli were assigned to that condition, and they... Ran them out pretty much how we've already discussed. So the simultaneous prompting and immediate prompt was provided. Uh, Whether the response occurred independently or with prompting, reinforcement was delivered. And then with the no-no prompt, they did it just how I laid out before. If they got it wrong, they said no. If they got it wrong again, they said no. And then they provided the prompt. One thing I noticed while I was reading this, and this might help you guys remember this too, is that the name no-no prompt is the treatment. Oh, yeah. (laughs) That's why I was no, like, why is it no, no? no. Mm. Then you prompt. Yes. Oh, that's awesome. Yes. Like, no, no. Clever. It's like in Jurassic, Jurassic Park. We're like, ah, ah, ah. You didn't you say didn't, the magic word. You didn't say the magic word. Because uh, I was like, that's kind of a weird way to name it. But then I realized it's just it's actually a no. description no. of what right. you do. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I really spent the whole article going, when are they going to go, no, no. No, no. No, no, no. No, no, no. No, no. no. Yeah. I'm glad they don't do that because that would really make me hate this. We chose this condescending prompt for right. children. Exactly. <laughs> I wonder if it works. So they compared between those two. And they did this three different times. So once the first set was trained, they did the full probe again across all sets. Then they moved to the next set of two stimuli. They did the probe again across all sets. And then finally to the last set. So there was replication within each participant as well. And then at the end of everything, they... Throughout the whole study, they had been using color-coded placemats. Yep. For the probe condition was blue, the no-no prompt was red, and then the simultaneous prompt was yellow. So those were present underneath the stimuli. And every third session, they presented the red and the yellow placemats together and said, which one of these you know, work tasks would you like to do first today? So they could choose. So at the end of everything, they went back and analyzed what those uh, preference assessment data looked like for the different prompting conditions, too, which was nice. I love, we've talked about that before, that I love the inclusion of that. All right. The DV, correct responding, and prompted responding. Jackie, they had some nice PI data. They did. Procedural integrity, which is critical. Right. You can't have the study without having procedural integrity data. Mm Mm-hmm. So they looked at how well the experimenter implemented the simultaneous and the no-no prompt. Guess what? They did great. They did great. I know you're shocked. And then they also threw in there what kind of design this was. Yeah. It was a parallel treatments design. What is a parallel treatments design? Because I had never, that I can remember, heard of this design. It's not super common. So you can find it um, in a book by Campbell and Stanley. What's that book called? Oh, okay. Experimental Design. Yeah, I think it's called Experimental Design. It's like the plainest Janish book. Right. And it's white with blue lettering. Yep, exactly. And it's also... Do you know that I saw a, a copy of Strunk and White the other day that has a basset hound on the cover? I have that one. I love that. Like, why'd they choose a basset hound? Oh, because the whole thing is pictures in the inside. I'll show it to you. Yeah, I didn't open it. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's pretty. I have it. <laughs> okay. It's Will you buy me one for my birthday? Yeah. Okay. I didn't buy anything for your birthday this year. Oh, I did, actually. Yeah, you did. Yeah, I did. So next year. Okay, thanks. Okay. Also, they talk about the parallel treatments design with uh, Gast and Woolery in 1988. Um, So what it is, it's just a way that you can look at two instructional strategies or two instructional procedures 
in a multiple probe design. So across multiple, either multiple participants, in this case multiple pairs, this is what it's used for. And they suggest that it controls for all the extraneous variables because it's happening concurrently. It would uh, control for instructor, time of day, any other stimuli because Mm -hmm. it's all happening at the same time. Yeah. They defined it as comparing the effects of two or more independent variables on different dependent variables. I hadn't really heard of this either. I, in the past, have used an adapted alternating treatments design for this type of work where you're looking at two different skill acquisition programs. Mm -hmm. But as you can imagine, you can't use the same stimuli if you're making a comparison across two different types of prompting or any modification there because you don't know which one would produce learning so you need to compare across hopefully relatively well equated sets of stimuli so the adapted alternate treatments design works well in that regard too because you can be running concurrent acquisition for two sets of stimuli generally with perhaps an initial probe or initial baseline as well so i'm not sure how these might look differently Maybe that this one has kind of like a multiple baseline built into it and that you're doing it across multi- multiple sets. It's a multiple probe built into yeah. it and it has to be running concurrently. So yeah. each pair has to be running the same session across multiple pair sets. So it's that multiple Yeah, the multiple probe. pair sets. Yeah. Which is a nice addition. Yeah, it is. And it appears when you look at the literature review on parallel treatments, it's only been used with um, investigating response prompts. And prompting. Oh. Yeah, so. All right. Might be time to dredge it up, guys. Yeah. Bring it back to life. Hmm? Like an old typeface. Yeah, it's got the same guidelines. Sure, as or a zombie. I mean, that's what I was going to say. Maybe oh. a little less subtle of a metaphor. Yeah. It's got the same guidelines yeah. as a multiple probe design, but it's not only a multiple probe design. Because you're running a concurrent. Because you're running concurrent. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. So now we know. All about that. I'm time. I'm ready to talk about results. Me too. Are you guys ready to hear about results? I am ready. Are you sure? Blow my mind. I'm going to. Except that you already read it. But if who you will be sent to the wasteland? I did not predict what was about to happen. Nor I. All right. All three participants. So remember, they were trying to teach three sets of two stimuli in the no-no prompt and three sets of two stimuli in the simultaneous prompt for each participant all three participants mastered all stimuli using the no no prompt brady mastered one set of stimuli using the simultaneous prompt ashley and jeremy mastered no stimuli using the simultaneous prompt that's ridiculous that is ridiculous it is ridiculous it's amazing i did not see that coming how does anybody learn anything because everybody uses simultaneous (laughs) prompting Right? Because I heard the no-no prompt. I was like, that sounds like a prompt for people who don't know what they're doing and just are like, no, 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 do it again. No, 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 do it again. Right. No, 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 do it again. Right. You know, oh, you're building in errors. Teachers. You're building yeah. in errors. Yeah. Nah, 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 it's ridiculous. Oh, no. I don't believe it. The Tasmanian devil has joined us. <laughs> I was shocked. Uh, Big no-no had their hand in this, I think. <laughs> Big no-no. Big no-no company. <laughs> All right. Additionally, over the course of these three comparisons, the number of teaching trials for the no-no prompt decreased over time for both Brady and Ashley, meaning that they needed fewer trials to reach mastery for sets two and three, indicating additional, perhaps, learning was occurring. Not, Not the case for Jeremy, but was true for the other two. And when we got to the preference assessment, that part was more mixed. Brady clearly preferred the no-no prompt. Jeremy clearly preferred the simultaneous prompt. Ashley did not appear to have a clear preference for either. So that part, if that if that piece had shown that everyone liked the no-no prompt, I would have thought these data were made up. <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, to be honest, I actually can see that uh, the utility of the no-no prompt because you're building in conditional discriminations, right? So... We learn by making errors in the real world, Mm -hmm. right? So Mm -hmm. I wouldn't recommend this as a first prompting procedure, but I can see its utility by exposing individuals to errors so that they can learn from their mistakes in a sense and, you know, contact both the non-reinforcing contingency as well as the reinforcing contingency. 
I always thought that was such a yeah. platitude, though. Oh, we learn by making mistakes. Plenty of people make mistakes, and they never change their behavior, <laughs> ever. Well, that's because they're not sensitive to the contingencies at play. But it's here, only a mistake in name. Right. The reinforcement is continuing right. for their uh, error. Yeah, right? So here, in this case... The pigeon knows best, Rob. Yeah. Theoretically, they would be learning based on if no yeah. was aversive. So they lay out some reasons why they think this might yeah. have happened. And I think that I really liked the discussion of this article because they make some really good points, both for the results that they found and reasons why the results they found might be limited to this type of study. So first they talked about why do they think this happened? I don't know if they were as shocked as we were, but maybe they I were. Don't, I don't think they were. Oh, no? No. Just me? Yeah. They, re- I, they really sat down and were like, you know what? This prompt's probably going to be well, the best prompt. Well, because we, we're all... Like, to be fair, we all come from the same background where similar... It's errorless po- learning all the way. Right. Yeah. But that's not the case anywhere else mm-hmm. in the world. I mean, there is other places, but, you know, when you... Like Montessori school? No. I'm saying, like, other places that run behavior analytic programs, not everyone uses errorless learning. In fact, based on kind of just going around the world looking at what people are doing on my previous job... Which shall rename nameless. There's a lot of crazy prompting going on. That's huh. that's not what we do. Good to know. Yeah. So I think they probably were not surprised. Let's right, get well, a point. I'm going to save for dissemination. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Let's get to the why. Okay. So the first point that they made is a biggie. Using no no prompting provided differential consequences. Differential yeah. reinforcement for independent and correct response. That was not the case with simultaneous prompting. And I don't think that we can overstate the importance of differential reinforcement. We can. Mm. We are right now. We're overstating it. No, we're highlighting it. Okay, number two. This was only a two-choice array. So once you got it wrong, you knew the correct answer, right? Mm -hmm. So there was a good chance that these individuals were learning through exclusion. Mm -hmm. Or that they were just learning to respond away from... True. PS Delta. True. You hear once wrong, you say, okay, well, it must be the other one. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, although they did learn over time, and we True. saw them learn. So they weren't just responding after the prompt away. But they still could have. initially. But they still could have been always responding away from what was wrong before. Mm-hmm. So that has happened. Because they're only paired with one another. Yeah. Ooh, good point. They, yeah. they could have probed for that. Terrace 1963. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Okay. Finally. They pointed out that if, you know, for two of the participants for simultaneous prompting, it was just hand over hand manual guidance. So there was no observing response or attending required by the individual in that format. True. So they posited that with no, no prompting, they needed to scan the array and make a response independently. And that could have also contributed to learning. I've seen that before. Mm. How many times have you been like observing a... A, a teacher running some discrete trial program and the kids looking at the ceiling and the kid, the teacher's like, you're right, as they yeah. place the hand on the card. Like, that happens. It does, but it... It shouldn't. It's unfortunate. Right, but it does sometimes happen. Yeah, that's not what we want. We want there to be active observation on the part of the child. Mm-hmm. So. so those are really good points. They also had some considerations here, which was, first of all, the response topography in this study was limited to pointing. So it was all really receptive identification. Mm-hmm. Uh, so no matter you know which correct response, the answer topographically for the participant was the same. So they made the point that applying this to other types of more complex and varied behavior and response topographies could be more difficult. It just hasn't been done before. So like play behavior or imitation behavior or social skills behavior all required much more radically different responses on the part of the individual. So in this case, right, you hear that you made an error. You know you made an error because someone says, try again, or no. So you use the same exact response and just do it to the other one. But if, for example, someone says, what's your name? And you say, I'm five years old. (laughs) They represent the, the SD and they say, what's your name? You, you, you don't automatically know to say, yeah. 
My name's Diana. There's an infinite number of responses. Right. Exactly. Thank yeah. you. That's what I'm trying to say. So it's not that they don't know if this would work with other more complex response topographies. They just hasn't been done yet. But it could be a limitation. That seems like a huge limitation. Yeah. And, and I mean, they're, yeah. they're not hiding it because certainly in the you know, their final paragraph. So we learned that the no-no prompt is more effective for two item discrim- receptive discrimination. You it's know, in the title, too. They were, right. they were pretty clear yeah. that this is limited to this subset of learning. Mm-hmm. Right. Which, to me, I think the way you described it, Diana, with the, with, the, with the child who, what's your name? Blue. No. What's your name? Table? Ooh, right. No. <laughs> oh, sorry. Of all the choices, the odds were not in your favor. <laughs> right. You were going to guess right on that one. Well, it seems that this may actually make the child prompt dependent, right? Because mm-hmm. you have, they have to wait for that prompt. Keep talking until I get the answer. Right. It could be. It could. I mean, like, if you think But about hopefully it, differential reinforcement could alleviate some of that prompt dependency. True. All right. They would like to do this study with more types of participants. That's totally fair because they had three. They were good participants, though. I really felt like they, they yeah, ran they the did. gamut yeah. of, you know, simple to more complex tasks. Yeah, but there hasn't been much research here, so definitely want to oh, do more. Of they brought up the concern about the aversiveness of using no. Yeah, everybody hates that. Yeah? I don't want to be told well, no. Multiple times without getting Yeah, no. Right. right. Which is, I, yeah, whenever I, I think I've read about no, no prompting before, I've just been like, skip, because I don't like that idea of just telling someone no and... But not helping them further. Um, I'm just imagining someone telling me, you know, I'm doing something and I'm like trying really hard to complete a task. And someone goes, no. Okay. Okay. The first one I might do the sort of like, huh? Okay, fine. I'll do another thing. Do it wrong again. No. Well, then what the should I be doing? Right? <laughs> yeah. And one thing is, do you think about the rate of learning, right? So with simultaneous prompting, at least you're going through things quickly because mm-hmm. it's a, mm-hmm. you know, almost immediate prompt. You get it right. We're moving on. Whereas no, you get no, reinforcement. Right. So the no-no prompt is, you, I mean, you have to get it wrong twice before you get any sort anything. Yeah, like, what is the answer? Right? And so that may actually slow down learning, slow mm-hmm. down the rate of acquisition and make it learning more aversive. Yeah. yeah. It but didn't. In this, in this no, case, it didn't. It didn't but, but we're talking about the two-item the two item discrimination here. We're not talking right. about right. any other complex set of behavior where I, I still am very skeptical that this would be that effective. Maybe I'm being naive. I don't know. I would love to see this uh, replicated with a three stem array. Totally. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Let's do it. Let's do it, everyone. No one's done that since 2010? I don't think I so. I don't know. I, I did a I, quick literature review. No. I mean, we did a yeah. Cursor, like, yeah, cursory we, search. We were prepping for this. We didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't find it. No. So Dibs. Know, their, I got dibs. Sorry, everybody. Their point was this could be aversive. I, I, I do prefer try again at the very least. <laughs> no. No, no, no. There is some other no-no prompting um, by the same authors, however. All right, we should look into that. Yeah, 2011, 2015. So what was the 2015 one? Effects of no-no prompting on teaching expressive expressive labeling of facial expression to children with and without a pervasive developmental disorder and education and training in children and developmental disabilities. But I kind of want to read it. Yeah, Yeah, the the title is not as descriptive. Right, so I mean, there is limited research on no-no prompting limited yeah we uh, should get on that all right uh but their other point was it, it, the effectiveness that they saw with the no no prompt may not be related to saying no or saying try again at all it could mm-hmm. just be the delay to reinforcement and the requirement to respond again mm-hmm. right so you might not need to say anything mm-hmm. your frowny face <laughs> so so more research needs to be done there and then finally they also brought up that they did not do an initial color preference assessment before they started in on their mm. treatment preference assessment based on the color placemats. So they don't know if perhaps uh, Jeremy had a preference towards the yellow placemat, mm. for example. Oh, that's interesting. It's yeah. possible. We've yeah. seen it's, it before. It's always good to test that stuff. Remember the uh, Slayton article where they had the red and the, I'm sorry, the green and the black and the whatever, and they mm. tested all of those different things in, in their baseline to make sure there was no preferential responding. That was really well controlled. So I know that these folks were kicking themselves at the end of it when they said, oh, shoot, we didn't do that. Yeah. So it's a little bit of a limitation. That's it. All right. Well, I, I, I think we all want to talk about prompts and what we learned about prompts today. So let's move into our final segment. 
dissemination station. <laughs> Brought to you a nice by nice prompt you provided to Jackie. <laughs> Thank you. I know, right? <laughs> so we read two articles about prompting. Yep. Have they changed your mindsets about what your favorite stock prompts are? You know, yes, I think so. I I'm not gonna lie. I'm I like most to least. I really do. It'd be what I would start with first. I like saying most least least most. <laughs> <laughs> but I may change my mind now. Mm-hmm. I may, based on the Libby article, even though I've read it multiple times and I've never heeded its advice, I might now either do a most to least with the time delay or do a least to most initially just to see. You said you do most to least. I love most to least. But just with no time delay? Yeah. Do you Are you worried about achievement integrity? No. You just love it. I, I don't know. It's like one of those things sometimes you get stuck in a rut. You're like, I'm going to do this. And I don't have a rut that I'm currently in right now. But when I think about past ruts that I have been in, meaning yeah. I'm not clinically, I'm not doing clinical work at this very moment. Mm. But when I was doing clinical work, I mostly would start with the most, I would do most at least mm-hmm. um, with the population that I was working with. But I'm wondering if maybe that, that was an error. I mean, I, I love most to least myself, but I, I do like the idea of the most to least with a two second delay sort of being the, I don't know this kid. So let's just throw this one out there because it does take a lot of what I like about most to least. And it does take a lot about what I like about any sort of a time delay, just the sense of potential speed that might be gained because I've had way too many students that I've worked with in the past that it takes, you know, a couple weeks before we realize, wow, they blow through these most of these programs. And you're saying, oh, if we don't a two second yeah. delay, they would have learned two or three times as many sets of stimuli. Oh. And you, you, you course correct. But, you know, I, I think a lot of the kids that I, I that would have were successful with just most to least as is would still have been successful with most to least two second delay. Maybe not. Or least to know. most. Or least, or to, least, most, or least right. to most. They're probably quick learners. But well, well, the, the the student. But if everyone sort of because again, I, you brought up Diana the treatment integrity piece. I worry with least to most. I've worked with too many people who are very very good, but without constant supervision, would turn least to most into error, 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 mm. ineffectual prompt, ineffectual prompt, ineffectual. Prompt. Eventually, they get just, to it. At the end of the day, it's just plus or plus yeah. p. That's true, but I, you know, what exactly? When you have least to most, you know, do people follow that hierarchy? I mean, I feel most to least is, is is a very conservative set of prompts, and people follow them very clearly. But with mm-hmm. least to most, I feel like there's almost this wild westness of the prompt of like, this is what it should look like, but sort of do whatever, yeah. just as long as I get it right eventually. And I know no, too many true. people who've written it as like a self correct, or they'd write it as a plus because eventually they got it right, oh, and yeah. and and then you'd be dealing with this sort of like, oh god, are these people doing it wrong? And you, say what you will for no, no, but we train our people no, really no. well, and we do all these things really well, and we check our data really well. But that's just one more thing you now, as a supervisor, have to be wary of, have to be paying closer attention to. And everyone already is saying there's too many things to pay close attention to. So why throw one more in if you can get a similar result with a most to least two second delay? But even Agreed. With- Sold Ooh. to Rob. I don't know. Because if you look at other research looking at the two second delay, I right now can't pull it up. But it's from that same research group mm-hmm. that the two second delay most of the time is like a five second delay. That the two seconds is actually not oh. two seconds because people don't ever do the one, one thousand, two, one thousand. But now with our phones in our pockets, we've got timers galore. And nobody uses them. So I'm not going to set a timer for two seconds. Right. So I would tell them, set your timer for two seconds. <laughs> don't go on Facebook with that phone when you're done. <laughs> that fidelity could... Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, so that's something to think about, though, right? Like, just know that your two seconds is probably going to be five seconds, and it might be too long. (laughs) Yeah. It sort of comes down to the... Jackie. It sort of comes down to the do you want everybody learning correctly, and potentially you're missing out on some some speed benefits, or do you want to take advantage of those speed benefits and potentially be delaying the learning of a couple of your students? And there's not really a great answer because you want everyone to be learning maximally effectively at all times. Right. It's a conundrum. I think given nothing at all, I would say most at least two seconds. I'd give that a shot. 
and say that's my new that's my new starting point and i would just again as the person who would be in charge of you know clinical decision making would really be paying close attention to my data on a regular basis although i suppose i could do that with most to most to least as well yeah, you could. I mean, I do with most. I mean, I I have in the no, past. No, but with a two second delay, you'll be able to see if there's independent responding occurring much sooner. Right. Yeah. So I, I'm for the two second delay for sure. Okay. I am too. I'm just. I, I'm not trying to knock. Jack, it. you lost the argument. Go into the wasteland. <laughs> You're out of Thunderdome. I am. I am. I am all on board with the time delay. Just know that it's not going to be two seconds, and be okay with that. Okay. I'm not okay with it. <laughs> I'm pretty much okay with it. I'll survive. I have no concept of time anyway. Mm-hmm. It's true. <laughs> so true. Robin's like, as there's we, like 20 minutes. As we Robin's keep, still not I providing them I can get anywhere in, in, the, in the state in five minutes. <laughs> Don't worry. No, you always say it's 20 minutes. We know where we're going. <laughs> it's only 20 minutes. Before we go on to, the, the, I think, the second half of our dissemination, I did want to make sure if you're listening to this episode for continuing education credits, you get our second secret code word, and it is leaves. L-E-A-V-E-S. Leaves. Things you might be raking. Or of grass. You're going to make like a tree. Get out of here. <laughs> That's funny. That's about as funny as a screen door on a battleship. Don't understand. Anyway. What does that mean? You're going to sink? No, it's, it's a screen door on a submarine is the saying. Oh. Uh, uh, I sort of missed that one. Sorry. It's from Back to the Future, a movie Jackie has not seen. I know. Don't do not do it. I'm going to watch it. So I can it. tell you that as a child, if you left the door open, then someone would say, were you born in a barn? And you'd say, only a mansion with swinging doors. <laughs> Which is hilarious because where I grew up, we never shut the doors. So maybe we did. Like, literally, my dad, even now, like, I have a mischievous dog. And when we go up there, I'm like, please shut the doors. It's like April and it's 40 degrees out and all the doors and windows are open. And he's like, I just don't like the doors. I run into them because they're glass. <laughs> and I was like, we'll make them not glass. I don't have to worry. He doesn't listen. But I mean, they're always open and he'll like hold them open for hours. All day long, all, all night. Bugs will get in. I know. Ew. It's disgusting. We've had birds in our house. We've had uh, raccoons. Uh, we've had squirrels. Yeah, it's like we live in the forest. Perhaps you should do oh, some. Man. No, no, right? prompting. No, try again. The door's Dad. open. Go, no. <laughs> See what happens. And Dad will be like, oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> grab a tea kettle. Right? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh. Sing a song. Go manually prompt him to shut the door. <laughs> So okay, so 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 we agree we might change our most to our most to least prompting to add that two second delay. No no prompting. No no or yes yes. That's that's my awesome headline. Uh no need more info. Yeah. Yeah. I need a little more research. I like it. It's promising, but I want some more. Yeah, I wanna keep an open mind and I don't want to assume that just because that's not how I was trained to do things a million years ago, that I wouldn't change what I do. But at the same time, there's just so much about that prompt that it it doesn't it do, I, just doesn't fe- it doesn't feel there's something about it, it doesn't feel I think it's quite wor- right. I mean, this is just me postulating, but I think it worked really well in this c- scenario because it was a two choice array. Mm-hmm. Right. I think I the bigger take home point that I should incorporate into my own practice is providing differential reinforcement for independent responding over prompted responding. I, yes. do that. I think that's the bigger piece. I, I should do that. do that more often too. I I, I I also fall into the rut of the prompted, not prompted, or I I, re- I reinforce everything regardless as long as the answer is right eventually. Yeah. yeah. No, I I, I do think do that. I think that slow, slows down acquisition. Yeah. So that's my take home. Okay, that's a good. T- I think that's the. I think that might be the best take home given the information we have. But bam, I won Thunderdome. You did. You are the master blaster. <laughs> I never win. It's okay, Jackie. You don't need another prompting method. <laughs> Whew. <laughs> Whew. I can sing too. Wow. All right. Thanks, Thanks guys, for listening to our singing. <laughs> all right. So we've taken home and disseminated all we're able to with, with our prompting articles. But yeah, mm-hmm. let's, get, let's get that no-no prompt. Let's see how it does. Stacked up in some other training scenarios i would be interested in that totally if you do that research please tell us and we'll talk about it again in a follow-up 
episode. Yeah, call us. We should be. We could be in the authors because we totally we totally suggested to do it. Therefore, yeah, we, we copyrighted, we require a we copyrighted by the idea on that article. <laughs> Thanks. Right. Thanks to my friends at ABA and Sidetrack. <laughs> you guys are so awesome. Thanks to Rob for his great song. And Rob's got vocal fry right now. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> he can't help it. You know, it uh, He's so hipster. That's right. That's right, dudes. With your unbuttoned flannel shirt you have on right now. I mean, <laughs> he's wearing a shirt underneath it. Sorry. No, no it's, it's not. just open. just open it's just <laughs> to the elements. <laughs> you guys better watch our preview episode. <laughs> Rob's just wearing a Is my shirt okay? Shirt. No. <laughs> Put another shirt no on. One. What should I do? <laughs> Take funny. it all the way off. Ah. No. <laughs> Put on some sort of a tank top. I don't know. Where's that sailor hat? <laughs> That's got to be somewhere around here. <laughs> all right, guys. Enough, all right. Enough. All right. Enough malarkey. Well, we've gotten to the malarkey episode portion of the show, so that means the episode is done. Time to go. Well, thanks everyone so much for listening to ABA Inside Track. Thank you so much, Jackie. Thank you so much, Diana, thanks, for guys. being here. You're welcome. If you've enjoyed our show, we would really appreciate it if you subscribe on iTunes or wherever you get your podcast. You can also find us online uh, pretty much anywhere as ABA Inside Track. Our Facebook page is where we put most of our uh, posts. Uh, we post the episodes. We also post links that we think you will find um, uh, find interesting and some different pictures that we hope you find amusing. Usually on Mondays, we have that. Me Monday. <laughs> If you'd like to email us with ideas for topics or just to say hi, you can email us at abainsidetrack at gmail.com. Well, everybody, I guess that's all we have time for. We'll be back next week with a preview episode of our next exciting topic. But until then, keep responding. Bye. Bye now. Go to bed.